today on Truths That Transform. America is being conned, dear friends, and the consequences are serious. Gay rights activists, I was among them, worked very hard to make homosexuality look wholesome. And we were extremely strategic about it. It's the Church of Jesus Christ Welcome to Truths to Transform, a production of Coral Ridge Ministries. I'm Pastor Rob Pacienza. The enemy of our souls is quick to twist, obscure, and misuse the Word of God to lead people astray, calling things that are evil good and calling things that are good evil. And that's exactly what we see happening around us today. As sexual self-expression is held to be the highest virtue and proclaiming God's design is called hatred. On today's program, we'll discover the absolute clarity with which God's Word speaks to this. And we begin by introducing you to a remarkable woman who has experienced and even promoted the cultural lies from the inside, and now investigates them through a literary mind trained by God's Word. She's my dear friend, Rosaria Butterfield, and our own Christina Vidal brings us her story. The Bible's narrative is so different from the world's narrative that it sometimes makes it almost striking to think about how we got here. We live in a world where all of the exchanges in Romans 1, the exchange of truth for lies, the exchange of heterosexuality for homosexuality, and the exchange for the worship of creature for the worship of creator, has not only been codified, but it's codified in the laws of the land. You have the Obergefell decision, which legalized gay marriage in all 50 states, changed the legal definition of harm from a material harm, loss of job, to an emotional harm. You're not calling me by my false pronouns. You're basically not lying to me in the way I want you to. To the Bostock decision, that was a Supreme Court decision in 2020, that added LGBTQ to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So what is LGBTQ now? It is a protected civil rights category. You know, worldviews have consequences Bad ones have casualties. For instance, under the framework of the Bostock decision, states could grant broad access to what the LGBT lobby calls gender-affirming health care, even for minors. Before the Bostock decision, we had only one gender clinic that children could access in the United States. Now we have at least 271 gender clinics. Approximately 300,000 teens, ages 13 to 17, identify as transgender across the nation, a number which increased by nearly 50% just between 2021 and 2022. It is now pitting parents against their own children, creating chaos in families, and causing division in our churches. Stay away from Andy Stanley. Stay away from Preston Sprinkle. Stay away from crew. Stay away from these organizations that can't speak truth clearly. The Bible is not ambiguous about homosexuality. It doesn't say that if you feel homosexual feelings, you're a different kind of man or a different kind of woman. We have a gay rights movement that is inside the church. This movement that thinks it's more merciful than God is actually just a movement of man-pleasing. That's all it is. Rosaria Butterfield is an advocate for parental rights, an educator, and a Christian author. 
In her latest book entitled, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age, she tears down the false ideologies that have invaded our culture and seduced our churches into becoming allies with the sin of homosexuality. What's wrong with being an ally is the blood of Christ does not become an ally to the sin it pays for on the cross. And so what's wrong with being an ally, it puts sin on life support and it defies the blood of Christ. But in the 80s and 90s, Rosaria rallied for the lies of this age and was a self-described radical feminist lesbian professor of higher education. I help build the evil in the world that we live in now. Absolutely, I see that every day. Having been on the ground floor of the gay rights movement in New York, having been the person that did speak before the legislature, and very much was hired, mentored, tenured at Syracuse to make homosexuality look wholesome. And we were extremely strategic about it. Known as Rosaria Champagne until the late 90s, she worked laboriously for feminist causes and gay rights. A tenured professor at Syracuse University, her most popular classes were in feminist queer theory, with core beliefs drawn from Darwinian, Marxist, and Freudian worldviews. Rosaria was at the forefront of the postmodern LGBTQ political movement in New York that helped foster the cultural avalanche in same-sex marriage laws nationwide. We were trying very hard to represent ourselves as victims, victims of a homophobic world. And so I co-wrote the university's first policy on domestic partnerships, which was the first time that we could give a kind of legal category for your live-in lover and put that person on your health insurance. That was one of the things that rolled over into uh, gay marriage laws, to first domestic partnership policies, and then gay marriage. In 1997, a Promise Keepers rally coming to Syracuse prompted Rosaria to write an article about what she believed was a patriarchal, white, heterosexual, Christian organization. The Syracuse newspaper gave me an entire back page and they gave me this title, Promise Keeper's Message is a Danger to Democracy. I got hate mail, I got fan mail. One of the pieces of mail though was neither hate mail nor fan mail, which made it interesting to me because I'd much rather just have people engage with ideas. And one person did, and that was Pastor Ken Smith from the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. And he wrote a very kind letter and I thought to myself, wow, this is phenomenal. This is my unpaid research assistant for the book that I'm going to write on the religious right. He doesn't mind engaging with people who think differently than he thinks. Ken and Floyd Smith said, oh, you're writing a book on the religious right. Fantastic. And you have to read the Bible to write that book even better. And so we started reading the Bible together. I thought I was grilling them and they were evangelizing me. And it was perfect. I probably had 500 meals in their home. Pastor Ken Smith and his wife, Floyd, welcomed Rosaria into their home on a weekly basis, where their radical hospitality allowed her to ask anything about the Bible, and no question was off limits. All kinds of people were walking in. Bibles were open. Anything could go. You could ask any question. They prayed, and they put all of their problems and questions at this place called the Throne of Grace. And then there was this palpable peace. Wherever people were disagreeing, I don't know, you wouldn't have even known it. It was striking. And so there was something that I could taste and feel that the Lord was good. At the end of the meal, they would open their Bible and they sang a psalm and that was beautiful. We were singing Psalm 23. And I remember, I don't know why, but I was nursing a big, big dose of lesbian victimization. I'm like, I'm the only lesbian here. I'm a victim. These people don't really like me. And then you, the psalm turns, and there's the line, you know, about dining in the presence of my enemies. And I thought, yep, here I am, dining in the presence of my enemies. And then almost, I mean, it was kind of a lightning bolt moment for me. I realized... No, I'm the enemy. They are dining in the presence of their enemy, me. 
And they loved me enough to tell me that. And at a certain point, about two years in, after I had read the Bible seven times, and it was starting to work on me, it was starting to do the thing it does, because the Bible was starting to get to be bigger inside me than I. Friends in Rosaria's tight-knit LGBT community started to take notice that she was changing. One of her friends, a biological male, who went by the name Jill, expressed his concern. At one point, it was Jill who pulled me aside and said, um, something's changing and it's scaring me. And I said, well, I'm reading the Bible and I just want to know, what if you think it's true? See, because I kind of think it's true. And if it is true, if Jesus is, re is real and risen, then everybody in this room is in trouble and we are too. Rosaria was surprised to learn that her friend Jill had been a Presbyterian minister for 15 years, a husband, and a father by the name of Matthew. One of the things we always said is that we are consenting adults, we're not hurting anybody. And for the first time, I saw Matthew's wife and children, who are obviously casualties, to Matthew becoming Jill. There's a life lost. There's something really dangerous going on. And Rosaria, you're part of it. What side are you on? Soon afterwards, Rosaria's lesbian partner confronted her because of the amount of time she was spending in God's Word. And I thought, oh my word, have I become a closet Christian? Because there was a reason I was reading my Bible. And that's that I was absolutely drawn to this idea that there was the God of the universe who wanted to have a relationship with me and that this Bible was my lifeline to him. And that's when I realized, oh no, this is no longer a research project. After Rosaria's miraculous conversion took place, she and her lesbian partner separated. She left her students, her professorship at Syracuse University, her political activist followers, and abandoned the life she had once held in such high regard. As a great humiliation, I had to lose everything. And then to make matters even worse, I had to lose the people I loved. That's what it means to follow Jesus. After Rosaria came to Christ, she went on research leave in Pennsylvania, and the Lord led her to meet her future husband. He was a seminary student. He was finishing his last year at seminary, and I was teaching an urban ministry class that met at the seminary. But one of the things that really struck me about Kent was how much like Ken Smith he was, that he was a strong, godly man, and that he very much wanted to protect me and cover me. A lot of people saw in Rosaria not just someone who was saved by grace, but somebody who was a potential asset to some institutions. I just saw that she could easily, easily be burned out and just kind of be seen as kind of like a laborer and not as a child of God and not really looking for her need for rest, need for growth and faith and community. We're all called to serve, but we're not called to serve only but to thrive in the Lord and to be blessed and to be on the receiving end of ministry as well. There are lots of things I could have done, I'm sure, as a Christian professor at a Christian school or back at Syracuse, but I don't think there is anything more important that I could have done than Mary Kent Butterfield. And the Lord gave us four children through adoption. I was almost 39 when we got married. But to be married to my pastor, has been the most mind and soul and just life-giving and life-sharpening experience. I mean, Kent is my husband and I love him dearly as my husband, but he's also been my pastor all these years. What the Lord did is bring me to a place where I could, in fact, speak. We model our home now a lot on what the Smith's house was like. And so I am free to be a woman, I am free to be a heterosexual woman, I am free to be a wife, I am free to be a mother, 
I am free to be a warrior on the front line of a cultural battle. I am free to be a writer. I am free to be a teacher. I am free to be a neighbor. And that's a lot of freedom. Rosaria Butterfield is one of the most encouraging people I know. She has a remarkable personal testimony of being delivered from homosexuality by Jesus Christ. And she also has the literary and theological mind to see how the Bible's narrative of humanity is wildly at odds with our culture's narrative. Having been inside the lifestyle, Rosaria is uniquely positioned to speak to the flawed arguments and justifications of the LGBTQ movement. And there's even now a whole new wave of those within professing Christianity who not only reject the traditional Christian view of sex and gender, but attempt to use the Bible to justify sexual sin. My pastor and mentor, Dr. D. James Kennedy, saw this on the horizon and he dismantles it with biblical clarity in his message, Entertaining Angels Unawares. An ancient story, a modern problem. In fact, one of the greatest moral, spiritual, and social problems of the last several decades. I refer to the problem of sodomy and to the story wherein the city of Sodom gave its name to live in infamy in that perversion of sodomy or as it is called today, homosexuality or the gay lifestyle if you prefer. And of course, I trust that the details of it are fairly clear you recall that God said that the wickedness of Sodom uh, had come up to heaven and that he was going to destroy the city and God, Adam, Abraham pled that he would not destroy the righteous with the wicked and if there were 50 wicked he agreed he would spare 40, 30 and down to 10. Apparently there were not so much as 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom and so the city was destroyed and uh, Lot offered to these gentlemen to come into his home, to wash their feet, to rest, to eat, and rise up early and the next morning. And they said, nay, but we will sleep in the street, here in the square. And that no doubt caused Lot a good deal of concern. And he urged upon them and pressed upon them, no, come, turn into my house. Because he no doubt had seen what had happened to others in that infamous city who endeavored to spend the night in the square or in the street. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, as it is repeated, obviously these were infamous men, the men whose doings had caused the wickedness of the city to rise up unto heaven and to determine its destruction. They surrounded the house and they called out to Lot, bring out unto us the two men that came into thee that we may know them. Now, it's interesting that homosexuality and the homosexuals which have literally created a revolution in our society and culture have moved into the churches. In fact, they have established a whole denomination of metropolitan churches, 200 and some of them across the country. And so they now have been engaged in trying to twist the scriptures to justify uh, their sin which reminds me of Peter who talks in his, his epistle about those who rest the scripture unto their own destruction. Rest with a W-R. And uh, that is exactly what these people are doing. And so they have re redefined the sin of sodomy and the sin of the sodomites as being simply inhospitality. Inhospitable? My friends, if that's what it means, that they simply wanted to get acquainted and be hospitable, all the men from all the quarters, young and old, for the whole city came to know them. And to say that this, their sin was in hospitality is utterly absurd. And it reminds me that the weakness of any argument depends upon the lengths to which some people will go to try 
to defend it. And so they will go to any extent and link to try to defend their perversion as actually being scriptural. Be not deceived. My friends, the teaching of scripture could not be clearer. I remember 20 years ago, somebody asked me if I thought that was a sin. I said, friend, if the Bible does not teach that sodomy or homosexuality is a sin, it doesn't teach that anything is a sin. It could not, in my opinion, be any clearer than it is. Well, what is their response? Anyone who says that homosexuality is a sin, they simply say this person is filled with hate. Hate. They are a homophobe. They hate uh, homosexuals. America is being conned, dear friends. And the consequences are serious. May God give us the wisdom to wake up while we have time. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. My father, Dr. D. James Kennedy, was willing to speak difficult truth even though he knew that it would make some people angry. Angering people was never his goal, but he was willing to risk their anger if it meant bringing them the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. We do people no favors by letting them persist in dangerous falsehood, and the lies put forward by the LGBTQ movement are indeed dangerous falsehoods. This ministry, which my dad founded 50 years ago, continues to boldly communicate the truth in love. But we need your help to do it. There are many powerful political and business lobbies that would censor or silence messages like this. That's why we need you to stand by with us with your prayers and your donations. If you're able to give a generous gift, we'll thank you by sending you a brand new booklet we've just published entitled Answers to Gender Madness, a quick guide to help you navigate the confusion. It's written by Christine Sneeringer, who was delivered out of the LGBTQ movement and now helps others to find that same deliverance. In this booklet, Christine helps you understand in a short, easy to read format, the cultural, political, and ideological origins of the transgender movement. And she guides you through what to do when someone you love struggles with gender confusion. You'll want to get this resource for yourself, as well as for anyone you know who has children who are being influenced by social media, public schools, and the entertainment of our culture. It's yours as thanks for your generous donation. And if you're able to give a gift of $50 or more, we'll send you the Answers to Gender Madness booklet, plus our outstanding documentary program, The Gender Delusion. This cutting-edge documentary features journalists, medical professionals, attorneys, and worldview specialists unmasking the transgender phenomenon, tracing it from its frightening ideological roots to the incredible and often irreversible damage it's doing today. And it also features the story of those who were once deceived and entrapped by transgender ideology, but found healing and deliverance in Jesus Christ. This is the central battle in our culture today, the battle between God's design and sinful man's attempt to overthrow it and be his own God. It's essential that you be informed and equipped to understand this issue and share the truth with others. These great resources will help you do that. It's the brand new booklet, Answers to Gender Madness, a quick guide to help you navigate the confusion by Christine Sneeringer as our thanks for your generous donation. And the booklet plus the hard-hitting documentary program, The Gender Delusion, as thanks for your gift of $50 or more. Simply write to us at Coral Ridge Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to crm.tv. One of the common accusations made against Christians in our culture is that we are obsessed about issues of sex and gender. What business is it yours anyway, our cultural elites tell us? Why can't you just leave us alone? The design of these questions is to make us shrink back. 
It's meant to embarrass us into silence. But just who is it that's really making such a big deal out of sex and gender? Is it Christians who wanted to start having drag shows in front of our children at the public library? Is it Christians who redefined marriage and instituted civil punishments for those who don't go along? And is it Christians who want to claim for the first time in recorded human history that biological sex is irrelevant and that people can be whatever gender they choose at any given moment? No, and it's not Christians saying that if you fail to ratify someone's gender choice in your use of pronouns, you'll be fired or hauled into court. The left decided to completely recast marriage, sex and gender in one decade and enforce all of it by law and social pressure. They decided to put men into women's college athletics. They decided to haul Christian bakers before civil rights tribunals. They decided to paint rainbow murals on the pavement of intersections and they prosecute people who leave tire prints. So how exactly is it that the Christians are the ones who are supposedly obsessed with this? This is like slashing in someone's tires and smashing in their windshield with a baseball bat and then asking them why they keep talking about their car. This is not something that Christians started. It's something that the cultural elites have forced on us. And Christians have a duty to God and his revealed truth. He's revealed that truth both in his word and in nature. And he's done that for our good. God hasn't revealed these unchanging truths about marriage, sex, and gender in order to restrict us. As scripture makes clear, it's sin that actually enslaves us. Instead, God has come to us in Jesus Christ to liberate us. The world's picture of liberation is actually bondage, being enmeshed in sin, confusion, hatred, and self-loathing, and being proud of it. But when we turn away from sin and towards God and his word and his design for us, we discover that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. In a world that preaches deadly sexual deviance as self-fulfillment, the most unloving thing Christians could do is to shrug and remain silent, even if it would make our lives easier. We have a duty rooted in love to call image bearers of God away from sin and fruitlessness and death and towards life and flourishing in Jesus Christ. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. We invite you to join us at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church for worship the next time you're in South Florida, or you can tune in any Sunday morning via our live stream at crpc.tv. And make sure to connect with us on social media at Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube. And finally, make sure to check out our new streaming site at watch.crm.tv, where you can find all of our programs, documentaries, podcasts, and much more. And now, here's a look at the next Truths That Transform. The main issue Christians ought to be concerned about in America regarding this election is freedom of speech. That's next week. This has been a production of Coral Ridge Ministries.